Mike Aben, and welcome to my KSP campaign. At the conclusion of the last episode, I finally returned enough science to unlock a node here in the Research and Development Center, and I'm just sort of looking at what options I have. Ooh, ion propulsion, that is tempting. But that's really for interplanetary crafts, and uh, after today, I won't be launching any new interplanetary crafts for a while. Advanced solar tech with microwave transmitters and receivers for beaming power. Ooh, that is tempting. I definitely do want to get into that. But I also would like to start exploring the nuclear tree deeper too. Oh, we got a dr the dry cycle nuclear turbojet. You actually saw this a whole lot of episodes ago, but then Interstellar put out an update and moved this later in the tech tree. Probably rightfully so. No, with all of those tempting techs there, I think the most practical thing for me would be advanced unmanned tech with its 1.25 meter uh, hex S2 and RC001S probe cores. I think that has some more immediate uses, but uh, why don't we get into what we're going to be doing today? And as you can see here, what I'm really focusing on is my brand new... 3.75 meter mammoth engine. This is now the most powerful engine that I have, producing a top thrust of 4,000 kilonewtons. It's really nice breaking into the 3.75 meter parts for the first time. I have this single stage booster uh, bringing up my payload. And it's a payload of 17 and a half tons. It's not, it's not a bad, you know, that's, it's kind of nice being able to lift it up with such a simple booster. Anyway, let's talk a little bit about the episode while this thing ascends. Um, what we're going to be seeing in just a little bit actually is another launch. I'm launching a supply vessel up to Kerbin Station. And then once up there, we're going to be refitting and refueling my two Kerbin System runabouts and sending some crews on their way out to Minmus and on their way out to the moon. Those folks have been sitting in Kerbin Station way too long, uh, sitting, you know, sitting around doing nothing. I want to get them going. I need to get them out, especially finishing off contracts and generating some science. As for this particular payload, this is the MOHO-2 obviously on its way to moho and what makes this even more significant is this is my last interplanetary launch for a while um for the past several episodes my the vab has been completely uh consumed pumping out vessels for interplanetary launch windows this is the last one uh the launch window being provided by the window transfer planner mod i'll just provide you with the details here that came from the mod uh, the departure time is about five days. I have an ejection angle of 149.63 degrees to retrograde. I also need to launch into an inclination of negative 17.2 degrees. And if you put all that information together, this translated to a launch time of 019 and at that or, or 319. In this particular case, I did launch at 019 and I needed to launch at the descending node in this particular case and in the past i've talked about in detail how you calculate these things your launch times and what inclination you want to go into for these interplanetary missions uh i'm not going to go into that now in fact i'm just going to leave it the way it is let's talk very briefly about the payload itself this is a collection of uh probes really for mapping and for communication and for uh, doing some unmanned landers. Very much the same mission profile as the E-1 and the Drez-1 that you saw in previous episodes. Very much a similar sort of a design. So what we'll do is we'll just cut ourselves to this pre-orbit burn. Once again, we'll set ourselves up into an elliptical orbit so that we will return back down here to periapsis in about five days and finally do that ejection. And we'll be doing a whole lot of ejections in about five days because I got three vessels on their way to Eve. <laughs> going to be all doing ejections um, all around the same time. But that's going to have to be for a future episode. I think it's time for us to get to this supply barge. And here we have a launch 
Not on its way to Moho. Not on its way to Eve. Not on its way to Drez. No, in fact, its target is only 120 kilometers above Kerbin surface. This thing's on its way to Kerbin Station. And I don't know about you, but I've been getting so tired of interplanetary launches, I'm going to be actually rather happy to start playing around within the Kerbin system once again. Mostly because I just want to get some new tech going, get some into some resource harvesting, into some power uh, transmitting, and into some more nuclear stuff, and all kinds of things like that. I want to start building new vessels. And having said all that, this is a very, very old vessel. You've seen this vessel uh, before. In fact, you've even seen the style of lifter before with these four radial bore boosters, a design I've, told, I've said in the past I don't really like. I'd, I'd much prefer to build more traditional stack-style rockets rather than these radial things. Um, I could have easily have lifted this thing with a 3.75 meter booster uh, like I did with Moho 2 you saw before, but that would have increased the amount of time it took to build and I really just wanted to get this thing out there. I wanted to get it up to Kerbin Station. I wanted to refuel and resupply the uh, my Kerbin system runabouts and kind of get that going. So I, I just stuck with this this old design. Actually there is one new thing. It's not quite exactly the same. I did add on this new shielded docking port. That's kind of nice. It's still featuring uh, the homegrown rockets uh, Lima capsule, the, the black capsule at the top. I, I really like the Lima capsule. It's a combination uh, storage container. It holds all kinds of various, it has life support. It has, it can hold propellants. It can hold fuels. Um, it has some KIS storage in it. Um, and it's also a probe core. I think that's a really nice thing for these sort of, it's perfect for these sort of supply barge. This thing also has a whole lot of the, Mark One laboratory extension um, KIS storage units as well. So there's quite a lot of storage compartments on this thing, which actually I am going to be putting to use. Yeah, we're bringing up uh, some new air brakes. I've been talking about that now for a couple of episodes for my for my aero braking needs. Got batteries. Got some science equipment. Even got a new solar array for that one that Jeb busted on the station a couple of episodes back. I also mentioned. Uh, last episode when we were up at Kerbin Station that I've been using up all the docking ports. Well, actually, that's that's not quite true. There does There is a docking port that happens to be at the end of Gilly's debris here. This is some debris that I still have to bring down uh, to the surface to finish off a contract, and uh, I do have a plan for that that you'll be seeing in a future episode, but for now it's... Oh, oh gee, oh crap! Oh, this is a .625 Clampatron Jr. And I have regular 1.25 meter docking. This isn't going to work. Let's get Bill, who happens to be on the station, to start checking some of these crates here. See if we have a spare docking port. Yes! Yes, another docking port. Okay, okay. So what we'll do, we'll just take this docking port and we'll put it in place of the .625 meter docking port. We'll have to put it in the crate because it's too big for Bill to carry in his personal inventory. Then we'll just take it up there, do a little bit of switching. Now for Bill to um, access what's in the crate, he has to put it down. So, uh, oh, oh no, it's glitched into the fuel tank. Ow. Oh, wow. Well, that could have gone, I think the only thing I lost was the crate. That clearly could have gone worse, but I ended up losing the docking port along with that crate, and that was my only spare docking port, so, uh, plan B. <laughs> plan B. Val and Bartner undock the Karayan 1, and they're just going to kind of park it off to the side here, and then we'll dock the fuel barge. And we'll just have to disembark everything, like, really quickly, hoping the crime one doesn't drift too far away. Uh, yeah, I think I got burned there by my, uh, sort of laggy frame rate that's been happening. Yeah, unfortunately, I've got a lot of parts here with the station and all of these vehicles, and, uh, my processor, not a fan. I mean, this doesn't look bad now, but that's only because I'm 
speeding up the playback and cutting out the stutters that come up. You know, I really should have a long time ago installed uh, the welding mod that allows you to weld parts together, but um, that really doesn't help me now because you can only weld parts in the VAB or the space plane hanger. So stuff that's already in space, it's tough you're stuck with what you got. And probably when I go to 1.2 eventually, I probably will install that welding mod and start uh, start using that for future missions. I guess another option as well would have been to use some fuel lines to uh, dock the fuel barge, but uh, fuel lines with massive vehicles and when you're pumping large amount of mass back and forth, I find the fuel lines can get a little bit sketchy, so I think this is a little bit safer. Bill's going to have to do most of the moving of supplies back and forth through EVA. Uh, the station really does need some more internal storage. When you have internal storage, you can just drag and drop things around the internal storage compartments, but the station only has one internal storage unit. The future docking module that should be coming up in a soon to come episode does have quite a lot of internal storage so that's going to be dealt with in the future you can also see that bill is using the suddenly spare <laughs> mounting bracket for the crates to his advantage so uh yeah at least they're not going to float around and glitch into things anymore and the thing is though that the um the air brakes and the gigantic solar panel are pretty big i can only get two of them in the crates so this actually ended up taking quite a bit of time, Bill just shuffling back and forth and installing things. And in the whole, you know, during this whole process, the Karine is drifting further away. And that kind of gave me a better idea how to deal with this situation. I guess I'm now up to plan C, but I do have a spare Clampatron Jr. So what I'll do is I'll get Bill to go up here. We'll attach this docking port to the side of the fuel module. And I also happen to have a lot of spare RCS blocks. So what we're going to do is we're going to go up to Gilly's Debris here, make sure Gilly's Debris is full of monoprop, and see if we can not turn this into something that we can fly. Now I'm just guessing at where the center of mass is. We should put the RCS blocks right on the center of mass, but I'm, we're going to just have to do the best that we can uh, just with our eyeballs. And then we're going to get Jeb and Bill to test out their new spaceship. Okay, so we'll just rotate this. Line up the docking ports. Okay, let's see how this works. Oh, it's just holding on to its vector perfectly. This thing flies wonderfully. This is the part where Bill turns to Jeb and just says, Von Kerman, eat your heart out with your fancy VAB and service bays. We don't need you to build a spaceship. And this is where Jeb turns to Bill and says, This thing is amazing. I bet you I could body lift this right down into the ocean to the east of the Kerbal Space Center. What do you say, Bill? Should we go for it? To which Bill only replies with stunned silence. All these years together and Bill still can't tell when Jeb is joking or not. Really looking at this, I mean I should have done this a long time ago. I've been clogging up that, that forward docking port forever. We are now just about there. Oh, there we go. We are docked. And then it was a pretty simple matter for Val and Bartner to bring in the Karayan one and dock it at this newly liberated forward docking berth. And once this was accomplished, it was just time to transfer over the rest of the resources that were ab aboard the barge, get over the rest of the supplies. And then it was time to descend the barge. The barge um, is recovered. It has parachutes. So, um, and it's just descended just on uh, on monoprop, it's just the monoprop that it happens to have left over. I put a lot of monoprop on it. And actually what I'm just gonna do is I'm just gonna bring down its periapsis down to 71 kilometers, just above the atmosphere, because uh, we're actually right above the 
KSC right now. So uh, if we wait sort of half a day for Kerbin to rotate around, then I can push it down into the atmosphere below 25 kilometers and then just leave it. And then stage recovery uh, takes care of the rest of it. And I find that stage recovery actually gives me about, when I do this, about 75% return when it comes to the recovery cost, which I figure is then worth it. Uh, then I don't have to ride this thing down. It saves me quite a bit of time. And speaking about time, I mean, notice the sun rising there. The sun was setting while the uh, Korion 1 was redocking. In fact, the sun has risen and set a couple of times during this whole process. This whole thing of transferring fuel and supplies over took quite a bit of time that I have been editing out for your convenience. And uh, we're not quite done yet because now Bill's got to get out there and start putting in the improvements that we're talking about. Starting with these new air brakes for the Korion 1. There we go, that's two. I do want to make sure that these things are at pretty much the same height and equally spaced around the fuselage here. Uh, yeah, that's looking pretty good right about there. All right, so Bill's got to go get one more of these air brakes and uh, he's also got to get himself these batteries installed yeah it looks like there's a reasonable amount of space on this fuel tank right over here so uh, let's put our let's put in a handhold here and uh, actually before I grab that why don't I retract this solar panel last thing I need is for Bill to go flying off and through that thing just for safety. It's always nice having the handholds. It really helps you sort of place these things accurately. There we go. There's one, and I'm going to put a total. Ooh, that's off a little bit. Let's put it back. Again, you can adjust. You can rotate these. You can turn them. I'm trying to get this so it looks right. It is going to be here permanently. You might recall that, uh, yeah, the Korean one has had some electricity issues when. Uh, when the science module is installed and we end up going on the night side of various planetary bodies. So I'm hoping this will help. Okay, so I got a couple of fresh batteries. And these, put these up before, that should do it, I think. Ooh, we have a ton of crap on this side. Okay, we don't need this. This is a smart part, I don't need that anymore. Now that leaves some room for the battery. I'm also looking at that dipole antenna. I don't think that's really serving any purpose. I don't think I'm a, yeah, the engineer chip. Once you've upgraded the um, tracking station fully, you don't need the engineer chips anymore for Kerbal Engineer. So why don't we start taking off some of this stuff? I'll send it down with some future mission returning to the surface. We'll, we'll send all that stuff down. We don't need that anymore. There we go. That is looking much better. And with that all done, all that's left to do is to crew up the Korion and send it on its way. And you can see once again the sun is setting. I should, of course, remind people that this doesn't mean whole curb and days are going by, of course. Our orbital period is about 33 minutes, so it's about, you know, 16 and a half minutes between sunrise and sunset. Still, gives you an idea that we are spending a fair amount of time just sort of experimenting with the electricity now that I got the science lab going again. We'll deploy these air brakes, see what it looks like with them deployed. I kind of have two solar panel uh, configurations for the Korion now too. The, the Gigantor I deploy when I have the science module going, the science lab going, because it really needs to generate that much electricity. And then I deploy the little or smaller ones when the science module's turned off. I don't know. Varieties of spice of life, right? Well, I kind of like this. I like it. I think I'm going to keep them fully deployed just all the time. I think that's a good look. Anyway, while these guys are getting ready to blast their way on to Minmus, why don't we talk about who the crew is, crew is going to be? Um, I am getting a little bit starved for crew with eight people. 
on their way, either out of Kerbin system or soon to be out of Kerbin system. Uh, so I'm down to crews of three for these types of missions, a pilot, engineer, and scientist. And so my pilot's going to be Jeb, engineer Bill, and McNan for our scientists. I'm picking them trying to maximize the experience that will be gained. And uh, they're going to be landing on Nimbus, and all of them will be gaining experience from that. In fact, Jeb and McMahon should be leveling up. In fact, Jeb should become a level 3 pilot after all of this. So it'll be nice to have a level 3 pilot. I don't have one as of yet. And then once this burn was taken care of and these folks were on their way to Minmus, it was time to take a look at what my moon transfer was going to be like. Now we're aiming for an asteroid that's in a polar orbit around the moon. And I want to time my lunch to, or time my lunch, time my launch. I'm getting hungry. Time my launch so that uh, we'll be intersecting with this orbit in an efficient way. And it's looking like my launch window is going to be about four hours away. That's okay. In fact, that's a little sooner than I thought it was going to be. But that does give me time to get Bartner out now. Bartner's going to start fixing up the Korion 3 in much the same way that Bill was fixing up the Korion 1. But one thing I do want to make sure that I bring along with me is this now free docking port that's on Gilly's Debris. I'll... Uh, I'll leave it as a mystery as to why I want this. I'll leave it until we're out at the moon. That will undoubtedly be next episode. And with that complete, all that was left was to time warp to our transfer window. And then it was the crew of the Korion 3 that was waving goodbye. And that crew? Well, my only pilot and engineer that were on the station were Val and Bartner, so no real choice there. Though this mission, when Val gets to herself on the moon, should put her at level 3 as well, so that will be good. My choice for scientists were either Chrissy or Bob, and the unfortunate thing and poor planning on my part, they've both been on the moon's surface before, so Chrissy's not going to be gaining anything from this. I should have sent McNand to the moon. He just hasn't gone anywhere. <laughs> so he would have benefited either way, and Chrissy would have benefited of going to Minmus, but uh, oh well. It's what I got now. Either way, these folks are on their way to the moon, and we will be revisiting them again next episode. But uh, as far as this episode goes, I have one last brief thing to show you in support of these two Kerbin system missions. This is the Kegel 6. Um, you may recall that the last time I was at Minmus, I was working with a lander that was designed for pulling Gilly's debris off of the surface and I wasn't able to generate too much science with it. This will rectify that. In fact, this is a pretty much a carbon copy of the Kegel 5, which is currently in orbit about the moon. It is chock full of all kinds of science goodness. And more than that, um, because it is actually a carbon copy of the uh, lander that was designed to land on the moon. It has a lot of Delta V to land on Minmus. So that means I should be able to do suborbital hops and move from biome to biome. I am really hoping that this will turn into a science machine for me. But that is going to have to be for a future episode. Next episode we will most certainly be visiting the folks of the Korion 1 as they come in towards the moon. Uh, we also have a whole ton of ejection burns to perform to be sending crafts on their way to Eve and Moho and we'll see what else we'll have coming up. But that's going to have to be for next episode. I thank you for watching and I hope to see you again next time.